Hello, everyone. Welcome to La Mesita. My name is Sandra. And Amherst. And today we have a very special guest with us all the way from New York via video call. Our guest is a visionary singer and music maker. She dipped in and out of genre and structure to create movingly powerful songs with her OG signature sound. Her powerhouse vocals are at the center of her music, which grows from a wide range of influences from R&B to hip hop to jazz, all delivered with a soulful punk aura. Pitchfork lauded the radiant singer as a unique new pop personality, while Profile and the New Yorker described her as rhythmically fierce, vocally generous music that slips through the net of any known genre. With us today, Xenia Robinos. Hello. Hi. Hi, Xenia. Hello. How are you doing? How are you doing during these times? Uh, music has been the thing that's been keeping everything together for me and being able to work. I'm really privileged to be able to work on music in my home. I have a studio. And um, so it's been, it's been strange. It's been pretty strange. Um, there've been, you know, up, upsides and downsides to this whole thing. Um, so I'm kind of riding with it, riding the wave. Um, during this time, have you developed any new guitar skills, hobbies, or created any new songs? I have made a lot of new music. Mm -hmm. um, I made about 11 or 12 new tracks, recorded them, and um, and you know, trying to work towards finishing this batch. And so, yeah, I did a lot of writing and recording. Um, so now I'm just kind of getting into when you were younger and first making music. Um, what kind of songs would you sing when you were practicing on your karaoke machine? Uh, I liked Mariah Carey. Mariah Carey was mm -hmm. my favorite, like always be my baby, fantasy. That was my, those are my go-to uh, songs. And then I started um, like making up my own songs and using this tape machine that I had to like layer voices and kind of copying, you know, styles that I'd heard before. And um, yeah, and making up my own songs. I listened to jazz music. So I started singing a little bit like um, Billie Holiday or Abby Lincoln. That's cool, that's cool. So like, how have you adapted to these new changes due to, you know, COVID? Well, to be honest, for me, in terms of my work, it hasn't actually really changed that much right now because it's kind of what I would have been doing anyway. I would have been working on a new record and that is mostly just really isolating and I don't really go out that much while I'm doing that. And I don't really see too many people unless I'm working with them. Mm -hmm. I just spent a lot of time in the studio. So the timing of this was kind of perfect in terms of the work that I was doing, but um, yeah, I, I've been adjusting by doing stuff like this, virtual uh, meetings and virtual hangs, virtual happy hours, like that's mm -hmm. been, just been the new, the new thing and just right. be as careful and, and, you know, considerate about my community and my friends and my family and making sure I'm doing everything to keep them safe, you know, that I can do. Right. Yeah, exactly. So how have you been maintaining your physical and mental health during these times? You know, because it's very important to keep that on track. Mm -hmm. Before it got really hot in the summer, I was running and I was riding a uh, city bike a lot. But then it got super hot and I got <laughs> lazy because I was like, this is too much. Like I would get on my bike and five minutes later, I was like... <gasps> So I stopped, <laughs> I stopped doing that. And then I decided to just try to dance as much as I can. My goal ideally would be to dance every day, but I don't do it. I don't always do it. But I definitely, <laughs> um, you know, feel a difference when I dance. Um, and in terms of my mental health, I'm very fortunate that I have an amazing therapist. I do therapy every week. And I'm able to keep doing it, uh, you know, weekly and virtually. 
Um, so that's huge for my mental health and um, yeah, taking time for myself when I need to, to recharge, um, getting sunshine, which is hard when you're in quarantine, but yeah. you know, getting out, getting some sunshine, um, eating healthy, um, yeah, being easy on the days I need to be easy, doing work on the days that I, you know, need to do more work and yeah, that's, that's how I work to, to be healthy in my mind and my body. Right. It sounds great, really. Um, it's not always like that, though. I'm painting like the rosiest picture. It's not always like that, <laughs> just to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's the ideal. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, are there any self healing remedies that you recommend? Or do you do it? Hmm. Well, a really basic one is like connecting to my breath. Right. Um, doing like deep breathing, putting my feet on the on the floor or on the ground, and just like my hand on my chest and breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth slowly, and just repeating that. You know, and that's a good one for um, anxiety or if I just feel my spirit. Like sometimes if I'm just excited about everything that's going on or everything I'm doing, um, right. or yeah, if I'm feeling anxious, that's something that grounds me. Um, another uh, physical exercise that I do um, is uh, you lay on, you get like near a wall and you lay down and you get like as close to the wall as you can and you kind of put your butt against the wall and your legs up the wall mm -hmm. and you just kind of lay in that position like back flat and like legs up the wall and that's, right. another, that's another exercise that's very grounding. Um, so yeah, I try to do things that are grounding. That helps me in my healing. I try to be patient with myself, with the, which is harder than others, and try to tune in to what I'm really actually feeling. Because I feel like a lot of times we're busy, 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 and we detach from what we're feeling, and then maybe it manifests in a different way, and we don't really know what's going on down there. So right, yeah, um, just like stop what you're doing, even just for two minutes, and say, okay. What do I, something really simple, like when you wake up in the morning, what do I desire today? What is my desire today? So sometimes my desire is, I wanna wear a baggy dress. Like I don't want anything tight on my body today because I feel bloated or whatever. I need to feel comfortable today. My desire is to feel comfortable today. So, you know, things like that, I think can be really healing. Being, being your own mom, like mothering yourself, you know, right. treating, treating yourself like if you were a little kid or something, like what would you, because a lot of times, you know, if a, if a kid was crying or hungry or whatever, you would rush to be like, okay, we're going to eat, you know, we're going to give you something to eat or we're going to make sure you take a nap. So trying to remember to treat yourself like that um, has been really healing for me too. Writing, right. writing things down. No, oh, yeah, writing is a very good way to express one. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's a little fun one. Um, is there a song that describes you? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Coming out the and game with the questions that I'm not ready for. <laughs> What's a song that describes me? Yeah. Hmm. Any song. Uh. Bad and bougie. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, da, da, da. I don't know. There's this really beautiful song that Nina Simone sings. It's called Wild as the Wind. That's a beautiful song. Re I recommend listening to it. It's just gorgeous. The piano. It's just her singing and playing piano. Yeah. Nina, Nina's very, so talented. She has a powerful voice. She really yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it describes me, but I like it. I like the sound. It'd be nice if I sound if I was a song. If I sounded like that song, it would be nice. But yeah. Now, really, just diving into your music career, I was just wondering, like, what was your initial steps into your career, and were there any obstacles that you personally had to confront? Um, when I 
first moved to New York, I was like straight out of college. I was very privileged to be able to go and study music in college. I was, I did my um, degree in three years um, by doing a couple summer summers, um, like not taking the summers off. And so I was privileged to come from a space of having spent a couple years, like mostly just learning about composition and trying out stuff musically. So that was that was really important. And then when I moved to New York, the, you know, trying to find a place to live, trying to find a job to maintain myself, you know, so that I could eat and pay my rent and pay my bills and at the same time, you know, make uh, music. So that was the initial challenge. Um, and I found an office job that I worked 40 hours a week, like nine to five. And then in my spare time, I would try to write music, meet other musicians, get people to play my compositions. Um, and my main struggle at the beginning was um, balancing that job, but also um, finding people to play my music that could play it. That was really hard. And that was a really big um, kind of obstruction or barrier to get over, because if I can't have my music played, then I, like, I don't, I can't share it with anybody and, you know, I can't get to the point where I record it. And I wasn't playing keyboards or playing any other instruments other than singing. So I would teach people my music. I would have to write it, you know, make scores for it. And what really changed everything was when I started playing keyboard and when I started looping my voice, that changed everything like immediately because I could play all the time. If I wanted to, it was only dependent on me. Um, and then the next big challenge was getting to the point where I could leave my job, leave my day job. That was really, really challenging. Um, and I worked that job for eight years until finally, like my goal was to make it so that my music business was so demanding and was so like, you know, time consuming and also like bringing in money that I could leave that job, like that it would have been a conflict. And it did get to that point because I was offered a tour um like a, a national tour and i was like oh i can't do this national tour you know for two months because i have a job so um that was the moment for me and i like transitioned out of that i was so scared i was so scared <laughs> and <laughs> i remember calling my mom when i when i got the offer for the tour and i was like mom i don't know if i should do this is it? And she was like you should do it you should do it so i'm also very privileged you know that i have family that you know, supports my, um, you know, me going after what I want. And, um, and she was like, go for it. And she's like, you're not going to find yourself out on the street. Like if things go <laughs> totally backwards, like you have a place to come back to over here. So right. yeah, those were, I mean, we could be here all day thinking about like talking about the struggles <laughs> that there are, but, um, yeah, those are some early ones. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow. Um, um, how important is music to you in your perspective? How do you think music is valued in the culture? I didn't hear the last word, how it's valued in culture and... Oh, through oh, sound. Through sound. How it's valued in culture. Um, well, I think art is really important to our humanity. It's the way that we express and understand things that are kind of unexpressible otherwise, you know, that we can't find the words to tell or to understand. So art, I think, does that for us. And it's a vehicle for us to kind of translate our experience through those mediums, like visual art, music, um, dance, theater, you know, all the things that you can think about. And um, so I think it has a very high value in understanding our, our lives and our humanity. Um, it's also a cultural artifact, you know, it can, it can express a time, it can express a um, place. Um, it also is tied to our memories. Sometimes if you hear a specific song or something, it reminds you of a moment in time. Maybe it reminds you of someone. Maybe it reminds you of an, you know, an important moment in your life. So there's, there's, um, there's that as well. Um, yeah, those are a couple ways I think that's important. Right. 
Um, music can be used as a tool to raise awareness, heal, and to transmit emotions to one another. What does it feel like in your nature with your craft? For me personally, it has been in the past just my every thing, like my every way of being. I couldn't imagine, I would always say I couldn't imagine being alive without doing that. It's just, it was kind of like my spiritual practice. Right. It was like my religion. It's my, um, yeah, my way of understanding the world, my way of connecting um, to other people and to myself. Um, and in my practice, it's really freeing, you know, because you don't have, really have any rules. There's no rules. Like you just do whatever you feel in that moment. And also you, you there's so many different ways to play with your process and switch it up. Um, and in terms of you you asked about affecting change right yes um for me music is is a way to ask questions you know i'm not an expert in government and politics and you know um human rights and there are other people who spend their entire lives doing that work that's so important and i admire and i and i don't pretend to be like an expert in any of those things but what I can do is share, you know, what I'm curious about and I can and I can put it out there in terms of this is my lived experience. I can share that. And by sharing my lived experiences and sharing the questions I have, asking those questions in the music, maybe I can inspire other people to have, you know, conversations about what they think. What do you think or disagree with me or hear a different perspective that they didn't think about, you know, and just by sharing my personal experience, that can be, that can, I feel it can invoke change. Um, it can, yeah, start a conversation maybe. Totally. Um, I was wondering too, like, just everything that you've experienced right now, what would you tell your younger self based upon your journey? Believe your own hype. You know, part part of when I'm making, when I've been trying to like grow my career and stuff is like, you're always like trying to get people to listen and, you know, play and I'm going to get on that festival and I want to get this opportunity or I want to meet that person or whatever. But really you forget to kind of, maybe, maybe it's a lot of hype around you or like you're trying to build up hype around you. But really the real, real, real thing is for you to believe that yourself, number one. Because that's really all that's really all there is. At the end of the day, everybody could just peace out and forget about you, or no one could care to begin with. But the reason why I do this is not for everybody else. You know, it's not for everybody else, it's for me. So if I don't like what I'm doing, if I don't like my own music, or if I don't really believe that that music is good, then why should anybody else listen to it? And why should I be doing it? So, yeah. 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 Um, um, so you so use Using your resources and craft to bring light on social and political stands, how important is it for artists to use, you know, resources, tools, and platforms to connect people collectively on social stands and manifestations like peaceful protests or community gatherings? You know, I think any time that you are uh, sharing your thoughts through any type of medium like journalism or music, art, different kinds of arts, it's an opportunity for you to communicate a message. So mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a really um, great thing to keep in mind and, and consider, like what message am I transmitting to people? Um, so one of those messages could be about activism, it could be about protesting, it could be about spotlighting uh, social issues. However, I do think that that's up to the artist. I don't think any artist is obligated to make, you know, art that that speaks to that. Um, however, you know, for me personally, it's just always been a pretty natural thing to talk about and to do. And it's mostly because of my lived experiences. You know, like I'm, mm -hmm. I, I don't make protest music. And that's something that people have sometimes referred to in talking about some of my songs. Um, but that's not the, how I view it. I just view it that I am what I said earlier. I'm curious about things. I'm asking questions and I'm just letting you know things that I saw, things that I wonder, 
And just by virtue of saying those things, then people are like, oh, that's so political. She's getting so political. I was like, well, not really. Like, I'm just letting you know this is what I saw and this is what I'm living. So, uh, but I think ultimately it is important that, you know, people are free to do that. I think, especially in the past, more so than now, I believe we looked for, we looked at musicians and artists as kind of leaders in a lot of these movements. Like we just mentioned Nina Simone, she was a leader in these, in, in these movements. Um, so many musicians were kind of beacons of, of all, you know, civil rights movements. And it's really important because they're accessible, right? It's art, it's music. So it kind of, it's, a, it's again, it's a way to translate these things that we may not have, you know, easy, easy um, words for or ways to, to express. So when, so it, when comes it comes to your, to your music, music um, um, what do you what feel, do you feel when you're when you're performing, performing a song, a song to a new audience? audience? The song always sounds really different when you play it in front of an audience. Literally, it could just be two people that come into a room and you hear it completely differently. Um, so there's that. It's, there's the first time I play a new song in front of an audience or a new piece, I feel surprised. I always feel surprised. I'm like, oh. And sometimes while I'm playing it, I'm like, oh, this section should be shorter or, oh, that section could be longer or, oh, that was too fast. Like you just, I, something happens in my brain that just uh, is able to be, I don't know if it's critical, but I just hear it in a different way completely. Um, so some things that you think are going to work really well when you're rehearsing it or when you wrote it don't work, <laughs> don't work when you're on stage or you're like, oh, you just, something happens like when you're performing, right? So you sing it in a different way based on the energy that's in the room. Um, and that, so it changes, it changes the song. When it comes to your performances, um, how do you prepare yourself? I practice. I try to practice as much as possible. It's not gonna be good if I don't practice, basically. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not a genius or anything. I'm not a, a child prodigy or virtuoso. And if I was a virtuoso, virtuosos are that because they practice. So it's a boring answer, but it's the truth. Like it's, it's like it's at that you know a lot of times it's, it's like a gym practice. You know, it's like you can keep to uh, you can keep doing those weights or you can run a certain distance because you always run that distance. You know, if you if I stop running for three months when I try to run a mile, I'm not going to be able to do it. So that's that's really the main thing. Uh, in regards to the internet, how do you think it's impacted music over the last years, and how has it benefited you as an artist? Uh, it's benefited benefited me in the way that uh, it's easier to share. Um, I mean, I I have only shared music in on the internet. Like I wasn't a pre-internet artist. So for me, it's just, it's kind of, it's always been this way, but now like there wasn't Spotify when I first started putting out music, there, Spotify didn't exist. Um, and, and um, so that, in that regard, it's, it's, um, it's been positive because uh, I've been able to engage with uh, a wider audience probably than I would have. And maybe more people from diff from all over the world can discover my music, and that wouldn't have been the case without the inter like the internet being a thing. Um, and yeah, so there's a certain freedom that anybody can put out music. You could put out a record tomorrow. You know, anyone can. You don't have to necessarily be on a label to do it. There's many ways to get your music on on um, DSPs, which are digital service providers, all of, like Apple and title and all that stuff um another a way that it's impacted the music industry in not such a nice way is that um artists aren't compensated um fairly for their work i mean they you could arguably say they never were um but the the that the monetary value of music is almost non-existent like there's almost no there's no yeah there's no monetary value for these songs or these albums um because the, it's all basically it's all owned by big companies and and it's you're kind of at the mercy of whatever their structure is like whatever they decide they do like whatever they decide that you can 
however you need to format your record to fit on their thing on their platform that's how, what you need to do um so that's that's really unfortunate and you know in another way it's just change the way people listen to music like the majority of people are not going to listen to a whole record like basically we're listening to playlists we're listening to one song we're making kind of like mixtapes we're making our what used to be a mixtape um so it's it's changing that the record format in a in a really big way where it's like why do you make a record unless it's something thematic or something that really it's not just like oh i made a collection of songs like it kind of needs to make sense all together and tell some kind of story visually um and and musically um because otherwise you just release a song because that's what people how people take it in yeah i know another thing that i've seen a lot of is just like the demand for artists to make songs very quickly and i think that's what the internet has brought upon and i i feel like the music process is you know it's not been the artist should drop music when they feel like they should drop music instead exactly. of just trying to drop something so people you know people are asking like where is their um uh, music so i feel like it's just a personal process and the internet has kind of tried to mess with that yeah i agree with you that's a really good point and you know back in the day dizzle when there was no internet and at, at like in the earlier days of the music industry you could like very few people were putting out records like i you know i may not have been able to put out a record because unless a record label financed it and put it out or someone put me on the radio i you wouldn't know who i was and now basically everyone you know this lady walks by me on the street she could put her record out next month like anybody can so what does that mean you have a wider variety of things you could listen to but also there's so much music there's more music than there has ever been available like you at your fingertips have the most information and music that you that anyone has ever had and because of that there's also this kind of insatiable uh rhythm of asking for more and more and more content and for creators to keep making that content to keep your attention because if they don't if they're not here every month reminding you if they're not on the gram every day posting their thirst traps you're not going to remember who who she is or who he is um because there's so much going on yeah definitely i it it has its benefits and then it has its cons yeah yeah for sure so i wanted to get down into your fashion now Does your fashion reflect on the music you listen to or perform? I usually feel pretty mismatched. I usually feel like there's a big disconnect with what I wear and what I want to represent. That's just personal. Mm-hmm. Um I think, you know, everybody has their personal style. It's not really about fashion, it's style, you know, for me anyway. It's not like I don't really know anything about fashion, but I know about style, you know, and having my own personal style cuz that's what making music is, like, you know, transmitting what what your style is as a person or whatever you're into in that moment. Um I do like clothes though. I do like clothes and I like glasses and you know, I like um vintage clothes because they I feel like they have a story and like everybody can look different because there's you know usually you just find one of that shirt or like one of that dress in mm-hmm. one size so it's just kind of like a coincidence like oh this happens to fit me and i like it and you know whatever it kind of has its own story so i like that but you know if you think that i if you think oh she dresses only in vintage that means i'm i'm like dressing as a throwback and i don't think my music is a throwback all the time so mm-hmm. in that sense it doesn't really represent you know literally the sound i make but i wish it did I, sometimes i'm like man i wish i was more cohesive and at my whatever i i wore sound, like looked like what my music sounds like but doesn't always happen i don't have a stylist i don't have it like that <laughs> right for sure um i was wondering in your video diosa you had you know a lot of colors and outfits and just your music videos in general they're just everyone every music video is very interesting so i was just wondering you know how do you go about creating your concept for your music videos usually at some point during making a song i start to see things images i start to see things or um and i write them down um so i just keep them you know as little as they come and then i don't make a video for every single song so it doesn't always come to light but um Yeah, I I 
sometimes it comes like that just from making the song and then other times it's most of the time I would say it's me like sitting down and being like okay what am I curious about or what am I what do I want to explore so for the Diosa video I had this I was kind of inspired by um gifs or I don't know how to pronounce it gifs gifs I'm like jiffy like Okay, but um, yeah, I was inspired by that and just like these bite-sized short movements and just, I was like, oh, I just want to do something really simple on a plain background and um, running. I was thinking about running when I wrote that song. I was, I wanted to write a song that I could run to um, that wasn't about, you know, like, yeah, turning up to the sound of my own oppression, like. That was, that was, you know, turning up to something like a, a personal mantra. So I wanted to run in the video, have it be like body, and then um, kind of try to um, exude strength. So um, a friend helped me, you know, pick some, some different looks to kind of, yeah, exude strength and um, just have fun dancing around. So we saw your video, Mexican Chef. By the way, congratulations on having this song on a Netflix series, Gentified. That's a really big, you know, moment. Congratulations. <laughs> so what made you write Mexican Chef? I was just walking around town, um, running some errands, and I saw restaurants, a couple restaurants in the area setting up for the night. And so they, they had... Um, you know, the back doors open of the kitchen and you could see mostly Latinx people chopping up vegetables and frying up stuff, getting ready, listening to um, bachatas, rancheras, like all the, you know, salsa, merengue, like that's yeah. what was blasting out the back of those kitchens. And in the front, when I, you know, if you go in to get a drink or something, it's like, whatever, Bonnie Bear, or, um, you know, just like kind of indie uh, music, uh, Teen Impala or something. So, you know, I'm like, wow, it's like two different worlds in this one place, right? So there's like all of this, um, these people who are behind the scenes who are m actually making the things that, that uh, are the reason why you go to this establishment, you know, and you don't see, you don't see them, you don't hear them. Or you might, if you go to the bathroom, you're like, oh, I can hear that. I can hear them, you know, talking, speaking in Spanish and I can hear their music. And you're kind of like, oh, that sounds better than what's up in the front. I want to stay back here and listen to this music. <laughs> so that's just, that's where that song came from. And I started, while I was walking, I started kind of just being silly and like um, making this rhyme up. And I didn't even know it was a song. I just thought I was making up a silly poem or something. And then I got home and I wrote it down. And I had been listening to a lot of um, Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings um, and listening kind of to like soul records and like that. Um, I started playing this bass line and then the next thing you knew it, I had recorded Mexican Chef. It was like pretty, pretty organic and kind of went through, but I just took it as a joke. And I think if I had taken it really seriously, I probably, probably would have never written that song, you know? Right. Yeah. Now, if you know any restaurants in New York, where would you say the best restaurant with a Mexican chef is at? Oh my goodness. Well, I don't know. <laughs> that's, <laughs> oh, I that I have no idea. That's really kind of impossible because specifically a Mexican chef, like they could be Dominican, yeah, they could be Puerto Rican, they could be Guatemalan, they could be Hondureño, like who knows, you know, but they're not always a Mexican chef, um, I gotta say. But mm, right around the corner from here, there's a Neapolitan pizza place. They make like pizza from Napoli. The owner is from Napoli. It's like very legit operation. I'm pretty sure all of their chefs are Mexican. So they'd be making good pizza over there. Um, but I don't, yeah, I'm not like, a, <laughs> I'm not like, a, a, I mean, I like eating. I eat, you know, I have no trouble eating everything. Yeah, um, I'm not a restaurateur, so I couldn't tell you the best restaurant or like, yeah. <laughs> I've been eating a lot at home also in these months, so. Yeah. 
Right. Speaking of that, actually, um, you know, all of us have been learning how to cook. Is there any dishes you've mastered? Oh, um, I can throw down on, on some arroz con gandules. That's like rice and pigeon peas, Puerto Rican dish. Um, plátanos, like tostones, which are like mashed plantains, like fried plantains. Um, I know several, you know, Italian dishes, get down on some pastas. Um, yeah, I, I, I got a few, I got a few in the bag. Mm. We've okay. got some not so serious questions for you. These are more of the fun, silly questions that we prepared. Okay. So if you were given the opportunity to sing to the entire world, what would you want to sing to the world? It can be, you know, any song from you or just any song in general. Mm. Any song. Oh, wow. I could sing to the whole world. I mean, I already kind of do because technically anyone in the world can hear my music. Maybe I would just improvise, make something up on the spot. See how it goes. If I just make something up on the spot, I'll never regret my song choice. So <laughs> I'll just do that. I'll make something up, improvise. Michael Jackson or Prince and why? <laughs> That's kind of an impossible question. Um, they're both incredible on their, like just musically. They're, they did so much for our culture, influenced so many artists. You know, what I realized is like Prince's music, you can't, like you can't really listen to it unless you're dancing. It doesn't sound the same. You don't understand. You're like, what is, what's going on? You have to dance if you listen to Prince. Um, but I probably, Michael Jackson. <laughs> but I shouldn't have said Prince, but Michael Jackson, but both of them. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> so in a parallel universe, what are you doing with your life? I am uh, a full-time activist, journalist, author, um, yeah, working to bring about social change, you know, maybe I ran for Congress, um, or maybe I, you know, started my own, like, activist group on, you know, finding a topic that I'm very passionate about and that I feel that I could be well-versed in. Yeah. This is a really, really serious question. Chicago pizza or New York pizza? Ooh. I feel like you always want what you can't have. The grass is always greener. So I'm gonna go for Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go for Chicago. Mm -hmm. I had, my first, Good I had my first deep dish not so long ago, a couple years ago. Maybe that's a cliche, maybe you guys are like, eh. But I, I gotta say I was impressed. It exceeded my expectations. Yeah, I love deep dish pizza. <laughs> yeah, so good. You can't really compare that, you know. But a dollar yeah. slant over here is, you know, if you find the, I thought I, I call it like good bad pizza. You know, it's not really, <laughs> you know, what I mean, like you could order three boxes for a party, like thirty bucks, whatever. Maybe it's more than that now, but you know, it's like good bad pizza, and that's it's always like late night breakfast. It's always good. <sighs> Now we have another important question. Yes. Chicago tacos or New York tacos? Oh. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. <laughs> I have some banging tacos in Pilsen, so. Oh, but God. there's a taco truck in, uh, oh my God, Sunset Park over here that's called Tacos El Bronco, which are the best tacos I've ever had in New York. But I've probably eaten more tacos in, in Chicago. Because I when I go there, I'm always like, okay, I have to eat tacos and I got to eat deep dish. Like, this is what's going on this weekend. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. No, I'll, I'll say, you know, Chicago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good choice. So, last question. Uh -huh. What can you make with a million mangoes? With a million mangoes? Yes, million mangoes. Mm. A stomach ache because I might eat all of them. <laughs> <laughs> really bad digestive problem. Um, 
you would need like a lot of water to try to mitigate that issue. Um, you could make smoothies. You can make some uh, tropical, you know, smoothies. You can make some drinks, some mixed drinks. Start a little business. You can start a little business on the side. You can make some sort of bay, like kind of situation. You can make a fruit salad and feed like the entire population of New York with that <laughs> fruit salad, you know, and be like, you don't have a stimulus package, but you got mangoes, so. Right. Bring, you can bring joy, bring joy to so many people. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. Mm -hmm. Well, we just wanted to say thank you, Zinia, so much for your time and just your awesome music. We're happy to share your knowledge with our listeners and viewers. And we just let us know where we can listen and support your music at. Thank you for having me. It's been really nice talking to both of you. Um, you can listen to my music anywhere you like to listen, YouTube, Spotify, um, whatever, whatever you like, it's, it should be there. It's, it's usually there. Um, yeah, you could support me by listening, telling your friends, sharing it with somebody you like, um, dropping in on me, you know, sending me a heart emoji. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Telling everybody to stream your music, of course. So we hope everyone had a wonderful time with La Mesita and our wonderful guests today. This was La Mesita. My name is Sandra. And Amorous. See you next time and have a wonderful day. Yeah.